Uh, to me, the main questions about time, by the way, I should say, this is a very awkward geometry uh, for a presentation. All of these TVs are my slides, so if you can see them. They're not absolutely crucial, but I will not be insulted if you're looking away from me during the talk. Uh, what is time seems to be a question that people have. I don't think it's a hard one, but there it is. Why does time have a direction? I think we know the answer to, but it raises a whole bunch of questions that we don't know the answer to. So I think that's an important one to think about. And then how does complexity evolve in the very broadest notion of complexity? There's a lot of complex things in the universe. So what is time? We do have two different ideas in our heads. We have the idea that uh, a non-physicist has, and then we have the physicist's idea. Uh, so the, and I know this because when I was writing my book, uh, about the arrow of time in particular, but time more broadly, I actually did the experiment and would ask random people on the street what time is. And I got all sorts of wonderful uh, different responses. But I think that it boils down to a feeling that the universe exists at a moment now. And we have something called the past and something called the future, and they're utterly different from each other. The past is something that happened. It's in the books. We remember it. We have access to what happened in the past through history, archaeology, the various historical sciences. Uh, but it exists in a slightly different way than the now exists. But there it is, somewhere behind us. The future is completely different because the future has not yet happened. It's not yet real. It is up for grabs. We can make choices. Uh, there can be purposes to things. We can influence what happens in the future in a way that obviously is not true for the past. Then along comes Isaac Newton, Pierre Simon Laplace, etc. The physicists chime in and they realize that the fundamental laws of physics, at least as they understood them at the time, and one could argue about our current understanding, that the laws of physics don't distinguish between the past and the future. They're treated equally well. They're treated on equal footing. Furthermore, even more profoundly, if you know what the universe is doing at one moment of time, then in principle, if you're Laplace's demon, a vast intelligence that has access to everything in the universe and all the laws of physics, you can say exactly what the future will be and exactly what the past will be. So this brings up the block universe view in which all times are equally real. No moment is any different than the other. So you have a puzzle that you can consider either deep or superficial. How do you reconcile the intuitive notion of time which treats the past and future completely differently from the block universe Laplacian view of time where all moments are equal? After all, we do feel like we are moving through time. Is that an illusion? Is the, the time an illusion at the physics level, the psychology level, and so forth? Certainly, at the very least, there are interesting psychology questions involved here. What is it about our motion in the universe that gives us the feeling that we are flowing through time, even if that feeling is not uh, an accurate one? Subsequently, we've learned a lot more about time. I mentioned these things because I will not be talking about them in this talk. We learned that time is part of space-time. This is what relativity taught us. And we also learned that even if the dynamical laws that govern the universe treat the past and future separately, observations are not treated equally toward the past and the future in quantum mechanics. We can say, we think, what happened in the past, but we can't make a prediction with 100% certainty for observational results in the future. I'm trying to phrase that as carefully as I can uh, because obviously there are different interpretations of quantum mechanics. Both of these issues, space-time and the collapse of the wave function, the measurement problem in quantum mechanics, will, I think, be crucially important, hopefully, for the conference. I don't have anything deep to say about them right now, so but you can think about them. What I do want to say is just at least one provocative thing, because I'm a, I like time. I think time is important. So I want to say that space is totally overrated, whereas time is underappreciated. Uh, I know a lot of people try to get rid of time, think that it's something we should you know, grow up and, and move on, and think that time is just superfluous. I think that time is going to last. And in fact, I think that it is impossible for any of you to use sentences that do not presume that something like that is true. Space, on the other hand, totally uh, bogus. Space is just an approximation that we find uh, useful in certain circumstances. And to me, the most obvious manifestation of this is in quantum mechanics. 
And the reason why space still seems to be there in quantum mechanics is because when we learn quantum mechanics, those of us who took courses in it, we start with one particle. And we have one particle that has a wave function that is a function of space and time. It looks like a wave all, all through space. But that's not really true. The wave function in quantum mechanics is not a function of space. It's a function of configuration space. If you have many particles, you do not have one wave function for every particle. You have one wave function for the universe. It is a function of what configuration the universe could be in. So space just looks very different in quantum mechanics. But time looks the same that it did. Time is there only once. It's not a different time for every particle in the universe, but it is a different space for every particle in the universe. So I predict that once we totally understand how the world works, time will still be there as part of it. If you look at Schrodinger's equation, there it is. There's no space anywhere in Schrodinger's equation, but there's time. It's there, three different appearances of the letter T in Schrodinger's equation. And I think that as far as we understand quantum gravity, there's evidence in favor of this view in holography, or in particular in the ads CFT correspondence that string theorists talk about. You have uh, a representation where the whole universe, the quantum state of the universe, is not described in terms of space, but in terms of a set of degrees of freedom living in a whole another space with one less dimension than the space has around us. And yet, time is still flowing completely normally from past to future. So I'm, I'm pro-time, but you're welcome to disagree with me about that. The next question, why does time have a direction? I also think we know the answer. Not everyone thinks this. We know the answer is because entropy is increasing. I'm going to state, uh, uh, stake out the strong position that the only thing that is different about the past and the future is that the entropy was lower in the past and will be higher in the future. We know that this happens. We know that entropy, the disorder of the universe, increases. The, that's not controversial. The possibly controversial claim is that that's all that happens in terms of differences between past and future. We live very far away from equilibrium. Uh, here's a little sketch by the noted artist Roger Penrose uh, indicating how far we are from equilibrium. The sun is a hot spot in a cold sky. We get the same amount of energy from the sun that we give back to the universe. We do not mo modulo global climate change, but mostly we are, uh, have the same amount of energy at all times, but for every one photon we get from the sun, we give 20 photons back to the universe, each with 1 20th of the energy. The entropy, therefore, is increased by a factor of 20. And in that process, we have life, death, evolution, memory, cause and effect. I'm going to claim that it's all because the entropy was lower in the past and will be higher in the future. Now, we understand why half of that statement is true. We understand why entropy will be higher in the future. Boltzmann told us why it is true. He said that what entropy is is a way of counting how many states of the universe look the same. So you say, well, we observe something, we observe the air in this room, but we don't observe every particle, every molecule, every position and momentum. We observe macroscopic features like its density and velocity and pressure and so forth. But there's many, many arrangements of molecules that look that way. The entropy just counts the number of arrangements of microscopic constituents that look a certain macroscopic way. In that case, it's perfectly obvious why entropy goes up, because there are more ways to be high entropy than to be low entropy. The mystery is why the entropy was lower in the past. And many uh, physicist hours have been killed trying to derive from Boltzmann's formalism the fact that entropy should go up into the future but down into the past, but you can't derive it. Here is a simulation of a box of gas, the entropy uh, being fixed not by being low at one end, but by being low in the middle. And you see that the generic behavior is for entropy to be higher both to the past and the future. That is what is predicted by Boltzmann's formalism, but is not what the universe does. To explain what the universe does, we need something other than Boltzmann's formalism. We need something called the past hypothesis, the idea that the universe long ago, the observable part of the universe anyway, was in a low entropy state of the form that it would sort of naturally grow into the universe we observe today. This is not an observational fact. We can look at what the early universe looks like to us today, but what we're really doing is measuring the radiation field uh, close to us. We extrapolate from those observations to the early universe using the assumption that we started in a low entropy state. That's the past hypothesis. Nobody knows why the past hypothesis is true. Everybody thinks that it is true. The only difference is uh, how important people think it is. 
I think it's very important. I think once you get that, you get everything. You get why you remember the past but not the future. So here's a little picture that says our present macro state, the data we have about the universe right now, and all the various different trajectories that you could imagine going through it. Toward the future, they're all allowed. For the past, only those that are consistent with the past hypothesis are allowed. That's why I would claim you can remember things about the past, but not the future, because you have this huge extra handle given to you by the assumption that you started in a low entropy state. It picks out a very, very tiny subset of things the universe might have done. Obviously, it's a long road from saying here is why data we have right now can be thought of as reliable indicators of what happened in the past to how an actual memory works in a human brain or in a computer or in historical records. So hopefully that's something we will also talk about during the conference. Here's my favorite idea. I just had to throw it in there uh, because it's uh, on the organizing committee. Why does our observable universe have a low entropy in the past? My idea is that it's just part of a much bigger system. Obviously this idea of a multiverse is not my idea, it's a popular idea among many physicists. So I've been pursuing the possibility that putting our universe in a multiverse context can help explain why we have a low entropy in the past. As Anthony already mentioned, the anthropic principle is not good enough. The entropy of the low entropy uh, Big Bang was much lower than it needs to be to account for us being here. So if you simply imagine an ensemble of all possible universes, that doesn't do the trick. But in a multiverse, you can imagine a particular ensemble of certain observable universes. And you can hope that within that ensemble, when you get people like us, you get a low entropy Big Bang. This is very far from settled, but it's the kind of thing you might imagine being true. So finally, how does complexity evolve in the universe? So the physicists, as usual, have staked out all the easy questions. Why is the past different from the future? Uh, why is the entropy low in the, in, near the Big Bang? The hard questions come when you go beyond the spherical cow universe into the uh, complicated universe. So obviously there's a huge question just in defining complexity. Let me just pick out one simple definition. Sticking with those macro states that Boltzmann gave us, you define a macro state by saying all the different microscopic states of the universe that look the same macroscopically. The entropy counts the number of micro states that look that way, whereas the complexity it asks the question how much do you need to tell me to describe that macro state? So it's a completely different characterization of the macro state than the entropy. You can get confused when you, when you gloss entropy as saying order versus disorder because complexity seems orderly and a lack of complexity seems disorderly, but they're actually just completely different descriptions. And here is uh, an example of what happens as the universe ages. Entropy goes up but complexity goes up and then goes down again. So if you have coffee and cream in a low entropy configuration, all of the molecules of cream on the top and coffee on the bottom, there's relatively few configurations that look like that. You start to mix them together. The entropy goes up because the number of configurations that look like that go up. And you mix them completely and you're in a high entropy situation. But you notice that on the left, there's a very simple description. All the cream is on the top, all the coffee is on the bottom low entropy, L low entropy and low complexity. On the right, there's another very simple description. They're all mixed together. So it's maximum entropy, but still low complexity. It's in the middle where they're beginning to mix together that you would have to provide an awful lot of information to fully specify that macroscopic state because you can see there's all these little whirls and, uh, and tendrils mixing together the milk and the coffee. So complexity is not associated with either high entropy or low entropy, but with the growth of entropy. And this is true in the universe as well. Here's a photograph I took in my lab of the universe one second after the Big Bang. I used Photoshop to enhance it a little bit, but the point is it's simple. One second after the Big Bang is just perfectly smooth, hot, giving off radiation at all wavelengths it becomes more complicated. 380,000 years afterward, we have recombination. You can see the first ripples of density fluctuations appearing in the temperature of the cosmic microwave background. Here we are 10 billion years later and the universe is complex. We have large scale structure, we have galaxies, we have stars, we have continents, we have boats, conferences, foundational questions, institutes, and so forth. That complexity is ephemeral. It will not last, so enjoy it while you're here. Uh, 10 to the 15 years from now, we will all be rocks and black holes. All the stars will have burnt out. 
Many of them will start falling into the black holes, but they won't be shining anymore. And then one Google years from now, space will be empty. All the black holes will have evaporated into empty space. So the entropy will be high. This is the maximum entropy configuration we can be in in our current vacuum state. But we will be simple once again. So I would like to understand how that works. Entropy goes up as the universe evolves. Complexity comes and then it goes again. Somehow complexity needs that change of entropy to persist. I, you know, it's, it's irresistible to conjecture that there is some lurking law of thermodynamics that joins the first and second and arguably zeroth and third laws that explains the, the robust relationship between the existence of uh, increasing entropy and the persistence of complexity. Obviously, the complexity that we care about the most is life, so it's not just mixing cream and coffee. It's an adaptive system. It's self-organized, and these are all words that are, I'm sure, very important and I don't understand. So here's a picture of a sand pile. <coughs> But uh, life itself is more complicated even than the sand pile. So uh, if you want to know what life is, you should, of course, turn to a physicist. My favorite definition of life was given by Erwin Schrodinger. He says, life is something that happens when matter keeps moving long after it should have stopped. <laughs> what he means by that, I think, he didn't tell you what he means by that. It's in his little book called What is Life? Uh, I think what he means by that is if you put an ice cube in a glass of water and you put a goldfish in a glass of water, the ice cube equilibrates rather quickly. It just melts. The goldfish doesn't melt. Uh, if you don't feed it, it will die and then it will decay and it will equilibrate itself. But if you feed the goldfish, it can persist a very, very long time. Because feeding the goldfish means giving it entropy, giving it energy in a low entropy form. Or as physicists would say, giving it free energy. Life is a complex system that acts to turn free energy into high entropy energy. And so the reason why the goldfish can stay out of equilibrium for so long is because it feeds off the free energy it gets from the environment in terms of goldfish food. This is a paradigm for all life. And I learned this lesson uh, on an airplane sitting next to Mike Russell who will be uh, giving a talk uh, soon. I asked him what the meaning of life was and he says it's to hydrogenate carbon dioxide. Now it turns out that that is no longer the meaning of life. That used to be, back in the day, uh, in the very, very early days of the Earth's history, because there was all this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere with a lot of free energy, a relatively low entropy state. You would think it would want to go into methane with all the hydrogen lying around. And that the methane plus all the photons that you make during those reactions is a much higher entropy state. But there's a barrier. If you look at the picture, to get from the CO2 to the CH4, you need to go through steps that actually have an even lower entropy. So the point is that the purpose of life, the very first proto-life things that appeared here on Earth, were taking advantage of all this free energy lurking around. And it is, you know, there's, there's obviously details, which we physicists don't worry about, but this is what is going on in all the complex systems around us. They're, they're, they persist because they have this ability given to them by all the free energy around that they can maintain their complexity. That's probably a true statement. The statement we don't know how to make is why they choose to do that. Even though entropy goes up, there's no law of nature that says entropy goes up as fast as possible or anything like this. So I truly believe that there are waiting for to be discovered really deep laws that describe how nature works that connect the fundamental physics understanding of the laws of uh, nature that we have to all these complex phenomena around us and hopefully by the end of the conference we can get all that worked out. Thank you. <laughs>